Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I hope your week is going well so far. My name is Sharonda Williams, Communications Lead for the National Center for Primary Care. And on behalf of Georgia High Tech, we welcome you to our webinar, Dot Your I's and Cross Your T's, Do Your SRA, Please. We would love to connect with you on Twitter at Georgia High Tech, or feel free to visit our website at ga-hitech.org. And a little bit about our speakers today. Selena Williams is the Program Manager for the Medicaid Promoting Interoperability EHR Incentive Program for the Georgia Health Information Technology Extension Center, or Georgia High Tech. Selena has previously worked as an office manager at Eastside Internal Medicine, and where, where she has been successful at leading a staff through electronic health record implementation and manage the workflow to achieve attestation successfully. Her goal is to advance the mission of Georgia High Tech by working with frontline healthcare professionals to help promote interoperability. Our other speaker, Phoebe Nelms, is a certified MIPS healthcare professional. She serves as a program manager for technical outreach within Georgia High Tech. She currently uses her knowledge of the CMS Quality Pro Payment Program to assist small, undeserved, and rural practices in Georgia, successfully navigating the program's requirements for Medicare Part B eligible clinicians. She's coordinated Georgia High Tech's webinars and on-site for Morehouse School of Medicine, their privacy and security workshops that focus on HIPAA security risk assessment. Without further ado, I'm going to turn this presentation over to our speakers. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Sharinda, for your intro. Um, so just a little bit about who Georgia High Tech is. Most of you know us. We are Georgia's health IT center, and we help clinicians all across the state to really successfully adopt and use electronic health record technology. And of course, the big push from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Office of the National Coordinator now is that we move more towards interoperability to be able to exchange information and so that's something we are very much on board with because our goal really is to optimize the management of patient information so that there can be successful uh, exchanges between um, clinicians and, and places of service so that we move towards a value-based clinical model as well as support the best health outcomes possible for our citizens in our fair state of Georgia. We are located at Morehouse's School of Medicine and we're within the National Center for Primary Care. So a little bit of what we'll talk about today. This is not a deep dive into the security risk analysis. It really is um, a motivational speech <laughs> in a way because we want to review how important it is. What are the basic requirements and benefits of completing the security risk assessment? We'll also review the impact of completing the security risk assessment or analysis on your ability to successfully participate in the Medicaid Promoting Interoperability Program and also the Quality Payment Program, MIPS, promoting interoperability category. We'll also just very briefly touch on the updated tool that is now available from the Office of the National Coordinator. It is actually uh, the updated resource they provide to guide you through an acceptable, adequate security risk analysis assessment. So we, again, are really glad that you took the time today to join us because this is a very important requirement to meet. Not only to participate in the programs, but basically just to protect your practice because cybersecurity is very important and um, we really want our audience to be supported in being successful. So we want to see where each of you are. And to do that, we have a poll question to see where you are on this topic. So um, have you completed your security risk analysis? Of course, some of you may have already submitted your applications or attestations, in which case we hope you definitely have for 2018 and are working on 2019. It has to be updated every year. 
You don't have to create it all over again. We just want to get an idea of where our practices are. Awesome. So many of you have already completed that. And so this is a great reminder um, to be sure that you have all your uh, T's crossed, I's dotted, to make sure that it's adequate. OK. So we'll move on. You know, Selena, it's really great to have you as part of the Georgia High Tech team because of your experience as a practice manager. Um, you were responsible for making sure that so many pieces came together for your practice. And of course, the SRA is one of them. And why would you say that this topic really deserves everyone's attention today? Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Phoebe. Well, number one is the law. And of course, when we hear the word law, we know it's something that we have to do. And of course, if we don't do it, what happens? There's consequences. So, so to ensure we are compliant with the law, the Office of Civil Rights OCR provides annual guidance on HIPAA security rule, all EPI, electronic protected health information created, received, maintained, or transmitted by an organization is subject to the security rule. Risk and vulnerabilities that threaten EPHI must be evaluated. Implement safeguards to protect the security integ integrity of your EPHI. Mm. Well, that is, that is very true that if it's the law, we got to do it. Um, and in fact, under the HIPAA security rule, you're right, healthcare organizations are required to conduct an accurate and thorough analysis of the potential risks and uh, try to find those vulnerabilities that might impact the confidentiality, the integrity, and even the availability of the um, electronic protected health information that, that's held by the covered entity or business associate. And it's not enough to just complete it. But once you've completed the risk analysis, then you're required to make or take any additional reasonable and appropriate actions that you identify that would reduce um, the risks you've discovered. Of course, we can't completely um, protect ourselves from cyber criminals. I read something recently that said that uh, um, the Russian hackers are eight times faster than the North Koreans or the Chinese in breaking into systems. So it's something that is not going away as a, as a challenge for us in healthcare. And we know how valuable healthcare is, information is to uh, those nefarious criminals. So we want to do all that we can, not only to comply with the law, but basically because we really care about our organizations and our patients. So that's why the risk assessment is such a great tool, because it helps us to keep this top of mind. It, the risk ass assessment helps us to see if there is a problem that we can uh, mitigate or guard against so that we can really make a plan uh, to address any weaknesses that we find. And even with best efforts, unfortunately, last year, quite a few Georgia practices made it onto that dreaded wall of shame. In case you're not familiar with what that is, the US Department of Health and Human Services, through the Office for Civil Rights, has created this as a mechanism to notify uh, the public when there is a, a breach of health information. So we don't want to. We don't want any of our practices to um, be on that wall of shame. But unfortunately, that is a reality. So even though none of us want to get onto that wall of shame, this um, breach portal exists. And it's required, actually, by the High Tech Act that if a breach affects more than 500 people, then they have to um, put this notification or notify the public of this breach. And these all happened within the last 24 months. And they're currently under investigation by the Office for Civil Rights. And because we are, we love our Georgia practices, we didn't put their names on this list. Um, but it, this really highlights that there is a, a tremendous need to take 
protecting our patient's health information very seriously because of the impact it can have not only on them individually but also on the reputation of your practice. So, you know, um, it's not just about the organization's reputation and it's not just the reputation that's on the line but as you can see from this slide there are some pretty serious financial implications or consequences that can accrue to a practice depending on which one of these violation categories the breach falls under. So it goes from uh, the least impactful to the most. If you didn't know and you have an incident, um, then you could be fined $100,000 to $50,000 per incident, but Boy, look at that last line, up to 1.5 million. And then, of course, if um, you there was reasonable cause to suspect, then you could have you could have a, a higher starting fine. Willful neglect that's corrected starts at ten thousand dollars, but willful neglect that's not corrected starts at fifty thousand dollars. And you notice that all of these fines are per incident. So that really makes us stand up and take notice. Um, and that's why we really uh, wanted to do this webinar and entitled it Dot Your I's and Cross Your T's. Do your SRA, please. And even though we might sound like a broken record, it really is so very important to complete and update every year your Social Security Risk Analysis. It can make such a difference as to which one of these violation categories your breach event falls into if you have one. Um, we know that some practices, they really survive on a very thin margin. Can you imagine the impact a hefty fine like this might have on an independent practice? So doing an SRA can mean the difference between falling into the, uh, the green category or the red category. So then we might ask ourselves, what makes for an adequate security risk assessment? Thank you, Phoebe. The security rule does not require that you do the SRA just one specific way, but most SRAs have steps in common. It is possible for small practices, practices to do their own risk analysis using self-help tools. You just have to make sure it is thorough enough to pass a CMS audit. So what makes for an adequate SRA. Okay, you can follow Office for Civil Rights guidance. There are many right ways and should include identifying and implementing the most effective and appropriate. That includes physical safeguards, for example, building alarm systems, locked offices, administrative safeguards, staff training, policy enforcement, technical safeguards, secure passwords and data encryption. Identify and rate risk, inventory lists, everything that stores, transmit, or receives EPHI. Do a remediation plan. Plan to correct any risk or vulnerabilities you find. You all know that if you are participating in the Medicaid Promoting Interoperability Program that the security risk analysis must be completed to have a successful attestation. The map reporter allows you to upload your SRA, but you should always, always keep each year's SRA documentation yourself for at least six years. Don't write over it, save a new version of your updated SRA each year. This is the most frequent reason why failing an audit, not being able to provide the auditors evidence that you have completed a security risk analysis, well, an adequate security risk analysis. So this is um, the objective and the measure, and as I mentioned, um, this must be done annually during the attestation period of the program. It can be updated, review the mitigation plans, the safeguards, the physical safeguards, and just save this information and have it handed in case you are audited. This is very important that you save this information. Um, tell us a little bit about the quality payment program. Is that, are the SRA requirements the same? Uh, yep, pretty much. Um, 
They are because really they're based on the on the same legislation or the same rule, the security rule. And uh, any eligible clinician that is required to participate in the quality payment pr program, of course, they also need to conduct an adequate security risk analysis and keep their documentation for at least six years. Now, that's that's what I've heard on many CMS webinars. That six years, but other sources I've heard they even recommend keeping it longer, ten years. Um, of course, your uh, HIPAA security compliance is supported by your written policies and your procedures, which you should have in your HIPAA manual. Um, and those should be updated as circumstances or situations change in your practice. And so having those written protocols around things like uh, identifying and, and managing your vendors who may store or retrieve your um, EPHI, you want to also make sure that you have updated and documented business associate agreements with each of those vendors. You also need to review them and update them <clears throat> whenever there is not only a change in your practice but also a change in your relationship with the vendors. So this highlights really the importance of having um, a designated person, somebody who is responsible for keeping up with all of the things that are required to protect patient health information. And usually that person will be designated the role as the privacy and security officer. And your SRA actually requires that you designate someone to serve in that capacity. And as we review these requirements, we, we can see the impact of completing the security risk analysis on your participation successfully in both the Medicaid uh, Promoting Interoperability EHR Incentive Program and also the Quality Payment MIPS um, reporting. So as we um, go on to the next slide. Well, we all know that practices cannot prevent cybercrime completely, but they can reduce the impact on their practices by complying with HIPAA. So here's some of the impacts of completing the SRA for your organization. It ensures that the privacy and security of their patients are protected. It avoids possible security occurrences or breaches. It prepares you for possible audits. It also develops a remediation plan, and it is an ongoing basis for risk management. Even though we have spoken about SRA so many times, there are so many myths about um, completing an SRA. Okay, so SRA is optional for small practices. Of course, that is a myth. That is false. All providers who conduct certain electronic transactions, such as billing, are covered entities under HIPAA and are required to perform a risk analysis. In addition, all providers who want to receive EHR incentive payments must conduct a risk analysis. So that, of course, that's a myth. Everyone must conduct a risk analysis. It's the law, and it has to be done. And if you don't do it, there are consequences. The next myth, certified EHR is, is all we need. Of course, that's false. Even with a certified EHR, you must perform a full security risk analysis. Security requirements address all electronic protected health information you maintain, not just what is in your EHR system. My EHR vendor took care of everything for me. That's the mistake a lot of providers make. No, it's not up to your EHR vendor. It's not up to your IT person. You still must review the security risk analysis. Your EHR vendor may be able to provide the information and provide assistance and training on and privacy on security aspects of the EHR product. However, it is your responsibility. Um, e not respond, your EHR vendor is not responsible for making their products compliant with HIPAA privacy and security rules. It is solely your responsibility to have a complete risk analysis conducted. All I need is a checklist for risk analysis requirements. Checklists can be useful tools. Of course, that is false. Checklists can be useful tools, especially when starting a risk analysis, but they fall short of performing a systematic security risk analysis or documenting that one has been performed. And of course, the last myth says, before I test for an EHR incentive program, I must fully mitigate all risk. 
false. The EHR incentive program re requires correcting any deficiencies identified during the risk analysis according to the timeline established in provider's risk management process, not to the date the provider chooses to submit the meaningful use attestation. The timeline needs to meet the requirements under the law, including the requirements to implement security measures sufficient to reduce risk and vulnerabilities to a reasonable and appropriate level to comply with the law. So now that we have gone over why it is important to conduct a security, a security risk analysis annually to comply with HIPAA and to meet program requirements for promoting interoperability, Phoebe, why don't you tell us about some other services that Georgia High Tech offers to help providers meet other aspects of promoting interoperability? Okay, I'll give that a shot. Um, so just to provide a little background, one of the reasons why the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Office for the National Coordinator are so focused on HIPAA privacy and security is that this is foundational to the secure exchange of electronic patient health information. So the secure exchange of EPHI is vital to the coordinating of care um, and the ability to improve the quality of health care that is delivered. Having the right information for the right patient at the right time, it really can have life-saving implications. And this is really the push behind um, promoting interoperability. And as we take a look at our infographic, we can see that uh, Georgia Health Connect serves as our regional health information exchange. And it was created as a way for smaller practices. And as you look at the different um, organizations that it connects to, um, EMS, hospitals, small hospitals in rural areas, ambulatory physician practices, even the jail system and uh, EMS, and also community health networks. Um, it's a way for these smaller facilities to connect securely to the larger States Health Information Exchange, or GHIN. So um, as we see here, so there may be funding available to offset the cost of creating a connection um, that might be incurred to promote this kind of interoperability between all these participants and places of service. So we really um, understand that the health information exchange requirements are, are a bit challenging. For, for many of our smaller practices. So we just wanted to remind you that this is available. And we hope that you'll reach out to us, that you'll contact us for more information on this. Thank you. I hate to say it, but uh, <laughs> go ahead, yeah, Selena. Sorry, Phoebe. Didn't mean to interrupt you. Thank you, Phoebe. So guys, thank you for joining us today. And um, actually, this was just a teaser for our upcoming HIPAA Privacy and Security Workshop next month on site here at Morehouse School of Medicine. As we discussed, the importance of your organization's reputation and financial health are also on the line. Georgia High Tech invites you to review your processes and procedures around HIPAA regulations and the updated security risk analysis tool from the Office of National Coordinator during, the, during our interactive workshop. We will do a in-depth review of HIPAA privacy and security rules, we will discuss the importance of cybersecurity and how to protect your practice in the event of a data breach. We will also review requirements and benefits of completing the security risk assessment. And we will also have a hands-on demonstration of the updated ONC security risk tool, risk analysis tool. And we um, should, that link should be provided to you in this presentation. And um, I want to thank everyone. The registration has already gone out. We're circulating that registration twice a week. So please register. It's going to be a very successful, um, informative um, workshop. And if you have any questions, my contact information is also on this presentation. And just reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns. Awesome. So it's a shameless plug. We hope that you guys will attend because we're really going to get into the uh, the depths of it into the a deeper dive on how to really be sure that you are addressing HIPAA privacy and security. We have expert um, presenters who have years of experience in the legal aspects of this and it's really going to be wonderful and thank you so much Selena for um, 
the work you've done to to put this uh, workshop together. Well, I want to thank you so much for, to our speakers. Um, we are going to have some Q and A later, a little bit later, but let's um, talk about our upcoming events. So. On February 21st at 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., we have the DCH Medicaid Promoting Interoperability Program webinar, Inside PI 2019 edition webinar. Also, save the date, March 14, 2019, DCH Medicaid Promoting Interoperability Workshop will be held in Varasta. A GAC QMS webinar, Measuring Up with Georgia's CQMS will be held Tuesday, March 26th at 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. And how did AT, ADT alerts and redirects, how ADT alerts and redirects are impacting care will be held Wednesday, March 27th, 11 to 12 p.m. And um, that is with uh, the Georgia Health Information Network webinar. webinar. And also all of these links will be provided to you in your resource. Um, your resource box. All right, so we have a, we had one a couple questions that came through registration that I wanted to relay to our speakers. That question was: Our network and our EHR are cloud-based, but our consultants are wanting us to have a server. Is a server required for a system EHR backup plan? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so there are pros and cons to um, having a self-hosted or, or a client server. server. Um, the advantages of that is that, you know, the server is in your location and under your control. Um, and, you know, if there is, um, let's say, a, a hardware or software problem, you'd probably be able to call somebody in and get it fixed pretty quickly. Mm, also an advantage to having a self-hosted would be that you can access your information from your secure VPN connection or from any computer on the um, internet with additional software. Um, however, without proper investment in security measures, there, there are some risks for breaches in security. Most um, small practices or, or organizations that host their own, they, they cannot, they, or they may not, I won't say they cannot, they may not um, have the resources that, let's say, a, a hosted cloud service has to, to do maintenance and uh, provide the kind of the level of security um, fixes and address uh, those types of things. Um, and other advantages of a cloud-based uh, system is that you can access your, your information from any computer on the internet anytime and from anywhere. So that gives sometimes physicians greater flexibility as they're maybe traveling between the hospital and the practice to, to respond or look up something. Um, and, and also, if it's cloud service, you're not responsible for, for making daily backups. Um, of course, there, there are downsides as well uh, because access to your data may be slower depending on the service level agreement that you have. Or if there is any sort of internet connectivity issues, then your, your workflow, your day's activities may be interrupted. Um, also, if you terminate your relationship with your vendor, uh, you don't have access or ownership of the software, and, and so you may um, may not have access to the information um, that you have been storing there. So there are the pros and cons, and each have to be weighed out according to the um, circumstances and situations within the practice. And also, really, it's a you know risk versus reward. So it, it's really a decision, but it's not a requirement that you have an on-site server for backup of your EHR. Some are purely cloud-based and are still certified by the Office of the National Coordinator. So are there any other questions? So as, um, as we move towards uh, 2015 certification, everyone wants to become familiar with those uh, changes that might happen to their, to their software. And there'll be some 
learning curve as they work out the um, the transition from a 2014 certification to 2015 and everyone gets used to using that. Jillian, can you talk a little bit about the audits that may be conducted? Okay, well, I know we mentioned that quite a bit. Um, and so based on our experience with uh, what was formerly called the Meaningful Use EHR Incentive Program, uh, we know that CMS has always um, left that possibility open that anything that you participate as, as a part of a government program, the audit is a, a possibility. So from our experience in meaningful use, certain audit, certain practices came up for audit. In other words, what they do is randomly select a practice to review the information that they have submitted as part of their documentation for um, their attestation. And one of the things that they will review, one of the many requirements for each each measure is um, whether the security risk analysis can be produced. So let's say you submitted your attestation in 2012 and then two years later or so, I think they did 2012 audits in 2015, um, they might ask you, well can we please take a look at your completed security risk analysis? Well if you can produce it you're golden. Um, and then if it's adequate, well I shouldn't say if you can produce it, if it's if you can produce it and it is adequate and answers the, uh, meets all the criteria um, covering the physical, administrative and technical areas and that you've rated your risk that you've identified and created a mitigation plan um, and also listed all your inventory that stores or transmits EPHI, um, then you're good. However, the mistake some practices made is that they conducted the security risk analysis um, and maybe they didn't save it in a place where they could find it again um, or they know they have to conduct a security risk analysis each year so they did one in 2012 and then they decided oh we need to do one for 2013 let's just edit this one and they wrote over it. In that case then it, it no longer exists as evidence um, that it that it was done in 2012. So for the quality payment program we know that it is in the legislation that um, they too may be subject to audit and, and they've provided guidance to keep your information on record, on file, accessible to you for at least six years so we don't have any experience with uh, audits for the quality payment program. However, um, it is in the legislation that it's a possibility. So that's why we're encouraging um, everyone to conduct it, make sure it's adequate, and keep it on available somehow, some way, um, so that it can be produced even up to six years from now. So if you, you know, staff changes, whatever circumstances in the practice change, changes, someone needs to know where all this evidence is and be able to access it and share it with CMS. So we don't have any audits for the quality payment program to this point. We're just basing this on our experience with the meaningful use. Uh, Medicaid and Medicare EHR incentive programs. Okay, great. Are there any other questions? And if you find yourself wanting to um, have, you have some questions later, um, feel free to contact us on Twitter, ga tech or at our website as well. Well, we're going to close this out with saying thank you so much to our speakers. This was a great overview of the importance of doing our SRA and um, what we need to get everything done. Um, all of the information will be available at a later time. You can um, actually, actually you can see some of them in our resources box. I will keep the, the room open so that you can get a chance to look through some of them. And also, you, please look out for a post webinar survey if you did not register, you can actually take the survey through this link I am posting in the resources box. 
And with that survey, you can tell us what did you like about our, our about our presentation and what can be changed? What would you like to see next? Again, thank you all so much for joining us today, and I hope you have a great week.